Hello, everyone, and welcome to this incredible, incredible session. Welcome to Gaming a Scholarship, Creating a Space for Games and Academic Research. We're really privileged to have Dr. Jonathan Truitt here with us to talk about this interesting stuff. Um, if you're new to Goose, welcome. This is the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, where we uh, operate these webinars on, you know, around every two weeks, and we're glad that you joined us today. Um, I'm going to give Dr. Truitt's introduction in a moment, but just a few rules of the road and how we're going to go. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please just throw them in the chat. I'm going to be assembling them as you go, and then I'll pause Dr. Truitt every so often and, um, and give him some of your questions. So don't be, don't be scared to put those questions in the chat. And if you have any other issues, uh, feel free to message me as well. Um, and now it's time for me to introduce our wonderful guest. Um, Dr. Truitt is the Director of Learning Through Games and Simulations at Central Michigan University and Professor of Latin American History. He's the founder of the Reacting to the Past Game Development Conference and is co-president of the Rocky Mountain Council for Latin American Studies. His scholarly research focuses on, and I looked at this earlier, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, of Nahua and Spanish interactions in colonial Mexico. His use of games in the classroom started in 2008 with a one-day game on the Mexican Re Revolution focused on land reform. When students asked for a second day to discuss the topic, he dove into the world of game-based learning and hasn't looked back. The Land Reform game became his co-authored game in the Reacting to the Past series, Mexico and Revolution, 1912 through 1920. His current research looks at cultural exchange through games in colonial, colonial Mexico. He is often found somewhere in the upper Midwest between Minnesota and Michigan, camping, hiking, or playing board games with his family. Thank you so much, Dr. Trua, and welcome to uh, today's webinar with Goose, and thank you so much for being here. Moshe, thanks for having me, and thank you everyone as well. Uh, I was talking uh, to Moshe just before we were getting started here, and just before I share everything, a couple sort of rules of the road is do please have questions and post them. After a year of staring at a screen of names and sort of faces, uh, you know, I really like to interact. I do very much... Um, I apparently don't speak English very well at the moment, but uh, what I do is I do very active uh, classroom settings. And while I lecture um, when I need to, I much prefer to have sort of engaged conversation, give and take. I play games, obviously. Uh, and so having an hour of me as a monologue seems frightening. So um, interrupt and provide questions. The way that I'm gonna go through this is I'm gonna provide background on sort of how the center grew, because I know people are interested in that and sort of looking at creating one in their own place. Uh, and then we're going to sort of go into sort of the development of a press and why we've developed a press and where we're going and our plans for that. If you have questions on things that I'm not covering that you know we're doing there, feel free to interject and I'll talk about those as well. Uh, so this is by no means sort of a straight and narrow, it's sort of a meandering road. So with that said, um, let's get started. All right. So um, as I said, and uh, as Moshe pointed out, this is Gaming a Scholarship, Creating a Space for Games in Academic Research. Uh, one of the things that we were doing at uh, Central Michigan University is really trying to figure out a way to create a space uh, for learning that was beyond just the straight up lecture. Uh, and so one of the things I was trying to do with this one, as I told you, was come up with ideas for this presentation that wasn't game-based learning. So actually in this image, um, you have two of my students and they're working on an escape room. And that escape room was for the book, uh, um, ah, there's just, there's been a new show about it too. Um, takes place in Michigan. God, my brain is dying at the moment. Sorry, this is not the way I wanted to start. Um, but there's a book about people going that are dealing with disease, a pandemic collapse, uh, and they're traveling musicians going around Michigan. This will probably help some of you, and you're probably like, I know what this is. Anyway, the students were creating an escape room for it in 2009, and it launched, and there is one of the puzzles that they were working on. All right. So, where does this take us? Um, I want to give you a little bit about me because um, aside from the great introduction I got, this also informs my background and where I'm going. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota uh, that was in uh, Dakota County. So it was on Dakota land. 
I today work uh, at a university that bears the name of the Chippewas and is uh, historically Anishinaabek land. Um, I have been, uh, I've benefited greatly from the women behind me. Uh, I grew up with a mother who is a school teacher and my two older sisters. Um, and really along the way, there have been a few men in positions to advise me, but it's been mostly women um, who have made up my past, my present, uh, and my future. And all of this influences my research uh, and influences my study of indigenous gain, of indigenous peoples in Latin America. Uh, it influences my study on religion, uh, focus on women's history, uh, and now games. And so all of that is sort of a part of this, this package. Um, that I just want you to be aware of, right? Uh, my, my skills uh, as it is, right? Professor of Latin American history, director of the CLGS, uh, runner uh, to stay ahead of zombies, of course, uh, a road savvy traveler. And most importantly, uh, as we go through this, you'll see failure, as, the embrace of failure as an opportunity. Um, I'm known to roll a lot of ones for role-playing fans or people who, you know, if it's a board game and it requires you to roll high, I roll low. If you got to roll low, I roll high. And in um, games where fours suck, I'll roll a four. So there we go. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the adventure. Um, and I don't follow my theme all the way through because it also failed, right? At a, but we'll we'll get there. So I... I'm an academic. My mother laughed at me. Um, she told me to get uh, trained as an educator. I started teaching when I was 14. I taught swimming lessons for 14 years. Um, I helped my mom grade Spanish exams on the weekend and hated grading. And so I swore to God, I was never going to become an educator. Uh, and so I told my mom I would not do that. And so when I went on for higher education, I was planning to go purely into research. Um, and doctoral programs indeed teach you research. They don't teach you how to teach. They, and they represent that by lecture. Now, this is changing, right? But um, I was going in the early, two, in the early 2000s um, and I hold no blame to my um, mentors of the past. They were all fantastic, um, but I was not taught how to teach. My first teaching gig, I was, my um, advisor had me review a bunch of textbooks, one, and I had to justify them to her. And then she said, okay, let me see your lectures. Okay, go. And so I went into the classroom and that was my preparation. Um, actually, I was prepping before and then Hurricane Katrina hit because I was in New Orleans. So it was in delayed a semester for me to panic about it. It was lovely. Um, but I uh, didn't do games there. I just did straight up lecture but it gave me the itch to teach. When I graduated from Tulane, um, my first gig was a series of adjunct posts in Minnesota. I adjuncted at three different schools for a year. Um, and I did lecture, right? And so uh, Mosh mentioned that my, um, my Mexican Revolution game, and that happened because of a colleague, um, Annette Atkins, who I was frustrated and, yeah, right, I said my students snored. I'm pretty sure a couple of them did. Uh, and um, I was trying to figure out how to engage them, and I, I really didn't know what to do. I am, generally speaking, a fairly compelling lecturer. Um, by this, I've, I've had public speaking gigs. I've done theater training. I, right, I'm comfortable in front of people. Uh, but it wasn't working. And so she introduced me to reacting to the past. Uh, and for those of you unfamiliar with reacting to the past, it is a role-playing game uh, pedagogy based out of Barnard College in New York. And it is it's really basically live action role-playing games based in the past. The first game was on Athens. The second game was on the French Revolution. There were uh, a series of um, there have been a series of science games now, so it's, it's really expanded. It's in use on every continent other than Antarctica um, across the world, and it's got, um, it's in multiple, multiple disciplines. It's pretty highly regarded at this point. Uh, but when I was introduced to it, there were no games on Latin America. 
And so I looked at the French Revolution game and went, oh, a revolution. And I looked at my syllabus and I was teaching the dawn of time to the present in Latin America. And I was halfway through the semester. And in two weeks, I was slated to teach the Mexican Revolution. And I decided that, hey, I'm going to dump uh, my plans on Mexican Revolution and create a game on the fly. Now, I didn't do it as a full on LARP. I didn't understand that it was a live action role playing. And instead, I created a small group interaction with five characters where the students had to debate land reform. Uh, and it was planned for a day. And so um, as any of you who have done game design know that uh, in a two week span of time, you can create an idea, but it's not a good game. Um, it, it was not a particularly good game, but what it did do is it got my students active and engaged in the material in a way I hadn't expected. And at the end of the first day, they asked for more time uh, because, and I quote, these debates are really complex and we need to understand them more, end quote. Um, and that was from multiple students in the class. Uh, and so I said, yeah, let's, let's take Thursday as well. And we did another day of the game. And so every year, um, well, the next year when I wrapped back around to it, I built out the game more. And then I was teaching it every, the, that class every semester at that point. And so every time I would teach it, I built out the game more. And so that, how I slowly got into um, game-based learning. Now, the games continued. Um, so I finished that first year and then I got hired at Central Michigan University uh, to teach Latin American and world history. And when I was there, and this is sort of where I was coming from, I mentioned in my interview that I was doing the game, uh, that I'd started doing it, but I sort of did it a little trepidatiously, right? I wasn't, sure what people were going to think, but it wasn't the highlight of what I did, but it grabbed the attention of a couple of people on the committee, some good, some bad, um, but some people really advocated for me because they wanted to see the game go there. Uh, and so I ended up getting hired and I kept running it at Central Michigan University and developing it out. And shortly after getting there, I found out that a colleague I'd met in Mexico had been hired to teach Spanish down the road 45 minutes. And she's a specialist on the Mexican Revolution, right? Because I'm a colonialist. My period of time is um, 1521, basically 1519 to 1700 is my specialty. Um, and, and so I was working in the 19 teens. So Stephanie uh, joined on and her specialty is images of the revolution following it, right? So she looks at memory in the revolution. She also does a lot with gender and sexuality. So she was able to help us really bring in more female characters, more LGBTQ plus characters. Um, she was able to just help us grow in sort of putting in elements on art and music and memory. And um, we started building it out. And as we built it out, it got more attention both at Alma College where she taught and then at Central Michigan University and uh, Dr. Fame Camarena, who was the director of honors at that time, came and spoke to me. And he wanted me to teach uh, an honors course that went all year long. So it was for all entering um, students who were, um, they'd all gotten full rides, right? So these were the, the top picks for Central Michigan University for the year. It was a class of 27. And he was wondering if I would teach it. And he, he warned me that I'd get to do this class once and then honors was changing the way they were doing it. And I wouldn't get to do it again. But he specifically wanted me to use React into the past games. And then in the second semester, he wanted me to have them help build some games, have them actually do the game creation process. And so we ran my Mexico and Revolution game and they broke it, it was wonderful. Um, and I had to make huge changes and corrections to it because of the way that they broke it. And it was, I mean, it really was quite fantastic. Um, and then in the second semester, for the first time ever, I was in the position of teaching people how to build games. And this was my first major, I mean, I'd taken other risks like telling them, but this was my first, first point where I was looking at my students and saying, okay, we're stepping into a semester. And 
you are going to be learning from me in a space that I'm not academically trained in, right? I'm going to be teaching you how to build these classroom games. Um, and the way that I figured it out was by stepping through it and stepping into it and making a mess of it and picking it up and learning. And so what it became is the classroom really became this lab. And I had to get comfortable with failing in front of my students, right? Which is not something most academics are comfortable doing. Um, but what it did is it generated this really cool conversation because when things failed, like I would talk to the students and we'd see what didn't work and we'd pick it up and we'd look at it from about three or four different directions. And then we would re-implement just like you do with a game, right? When you play a game and a mechanic doesn't work, what you do is you pick it up, you look at it and you might eject it and get rid of it or you might tweak it and twist it and dust it off and figure out a new way for it to proceed. And so my students were seeing me fail. And in that process, these really highly motivated students were willing to take more risks for themselves. And they were really willing to do things that normally they, this was a group who had been really focused on their grades. And as we went, they became less focused on their grades and more focused on learning as a method. And so as the semester ended, uh, Fame came back to me again and he said, okay, so that class is done. But in the course of that semester, we had been talking and discussing game-based learning pedagogy. And I had talked about wanting to do board games and wanting to modify board games and wanting to do role-playing games in that space and wanting to build out um, sort of doing like the creation of games as a tool and trying sort of like to turn the classroom into a game, but didn't really feel comfortable as an untenured professor to do that in one of my other classes and have it fail. So what he did is he created a course in honors that was specifically a course for me to do all of that stuff. In fact, the agreement became that I could not use a pedagogical method that I was familiar with um, that I'd used before. It had to be something new. And every unit in the class had to be taught with a new pedagogical method. So I couldn't use reacting to the past anymore. Uh, I couldn't use lecture, though I, I did have to lecture a little bit to explain things, but I think I did four lectures. Um, I couldn't use reacting to the past. Um, and so the reason I'm getting into this, the weeds here a little bit on this is that it was this experience that launches the Center for Learning through games and simulations. This course, part of the deal with it was not only that it had to be new stuff, right? So, um, and the first thing that I did was actually a, a, an economic modification of Settlers of Catan. The students studied um, different economic models, and then they changed the rules of Settlers of Catan such that um, it reflected that economic model. So the, the Incan histories of Catan, I'm really upset. My students should have pitched that uh, to Mayfair long ago because we had it about eight years before they had even started developing it. Um, but my students, it, it worked amazing. Like they started playing each other's games. They could talk about these economic systems really, really well. Uh, and then the next game after that was a modified role-playing game and it fell completely flat. Like it dived and burned, like it was horrible. Um, but out of this, um, other colleagues around campus started learning what I was doing and they had started playing games. And so we uh, started to get together and um, talk. And what you're gonna notice is that there's kind of a trend. Uh, we would get together at a bar uh, and we would drink and not everybody would have um, alcoholic beverages, but it happened to be the best place in town with pizza. Um, and so we did board games, pizza and beer or whatever other beverage people wanted. And we started talking about those methods. Um, we also started developing out ways to help other people. So in this image here, you have a reacting to the past game um, on Greenwich Village by Mary Jane Tracy. Um, and it's a bunch of faculty and graduate students uh, who are there. And in fact, indeed, I'm, I'm standing in the back uh, in a skirt with a, a shawl because I was playing a female character. Many of my female students had cross-dressed and played male roles. And so they heard I was playing a female role and they encouraged me to, to dress the part. And so I met them 
and did that. And then it was great because it also corresponded with new student day or student orientation day as I was running down the hallways. Um, so, uh, but what we ended up doing is this is where we started getting into figuring out, well, reacting to the past needed new game mechanics, right? So my game had different game mechanics, but the reacting to the past conference itself uh, is a group of people who are non-gamers, which is one of the reasons I love it. Um, it's a space where people who are unfamiliar with game-based learning go and they get an introduction to it. Um, but even the founder did not know games when he started the process. This is Mark Carnes. He's a lovely person. I've since convinced him to go to Gen Con and he's engaged with game mechanics and a bunch of other things. Um, but so we started introducing game-based uh, game based learning mechanics and game mechanics through board game nights at the conference uh, to encourage people. And it became very, very interdisciplinary, right? Um, and the great thing about inter interdisciplinariness is that you've got a different background uh, from people, you get more ideas, you have more fun, you have more games. And so on campus, we became a really, really unique interdisciplinary group. Um, to my knowledge, we're the only completely intercollege like group. And by that, what I mean is there are six academic colleges at Central Michigan University, and we have representation in all of the academic colleges. We also, we also have staff included in our center um, who are pretty big board gamers and provide mechanic ideas and help us play test our games. Um, so we're a core group, core group that came out of the majority of the colleges. But again, going back to that idea, none of us had really trained, um, had any formal training. And so as we were starting to grow more, we looked for help. We knew that we needed people to help us out, right? And so uh, we reached out to the Institute of Play, right? They're based in New York City. Um, they'd been doing these quest, uh, quest to learn schools and they're no longer there. Uh, unfortunately, they, they closed a number of years ago, but we got a small grant from the Brenneman Jacks Foundation, um, the Ludus Project to bring them in and do sort of a game-based learning training. And then we, got, we were able to get them to come back and they ran a very intense, how to train the trainers, right? So they taught us how to train other people, right? This then came to us and we started making it our, making it our they had been focused on K-12. And so we started focusing on universities and how to train universities in that space. Okay, I'm gonna stop and take a drink. Any questions so far, Mosh? Not yet, but I'm, I'm watching the chat like a okay. hawk. Sounds good. Um, all right, so we started getting asked to train people at Central Michigan University. So I mentioned the escape room that my students built. One of the things I did is I built an escape room for my syllabus. Um, you'll notice I actually, I jump in, I started jumping into a lot of different games um, out of moments of frustration because what I was doing wasn't working. So uh, as many in academic uh, will, tell you, anybody who's used a syllabus in a classroom can tell you, period. Uh, the syllabus, you spend all of this time making it and then the students don't read it and they come back to you with questions and it's frustrating. So I um, I mean, sometimes they legitimately have questions, but sometimes it's, hey, when's the final exam? And you're like, it's, it's on the syllabus. Uh, and so I built an escape room in my syllabus. And so the first day of class, students would show up to the classroom and the syllabi would just be there and there would be locked boxes at the front of the classroom. And I would just smile at them awkwardly as they came in. Uh, and then eventually one of them would look down at the syllabus and they would start reading it. And as they read, as they started reading through it, one of them would suddenly shout and go, oh my God, we're in an escape room and five minutes has gone by, go, 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 right? And then all of a sudden the classroom like, erupts and everybody starts going through it. Um, and it was a really great way to start the class. And um, the students, I mean, in this one, I wanted 100% completion rate, right? And so it was, some of it was easier and you also have 12 people working on it and I'd split it into two, so you had two groups. So this here is me teaching faculty about how to use 
um, escape room ideas to embed them in your syllabi. Um, and what you do, right, is that we start we started training peers and it it started spreading at Central Michigan University. And then we're getting asked to do uh, game design workshops for other places, right? So, and some of it was kind of sneaky, um, not intentional, but a little bit so. Um, my So when I started doing escape rooms, um, the first escape room that I built was actually um, on Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and it was for my family. Uh, for a summer gathering, I just decided I wanted to do it. And then um, I saw how well it worked. And what I did for the next one is I modified a breakout EDU uh, game uh, for my kid's kindergarten class. Um, and we started, and his teacher was thrilled. And so I ran it for all the kindergartners. And what we found, and it was this, again, sort of that, that risk, and it was this fascinating, really, experience where um, the neurodiverse students who were coming into that space, who are ADHD or Asperger's or higher up on the autism spectrum, who had a really hard time concentrating in a normal setting, were engaging in these puzzles and solving them faster than other students. And they were making the connections and they were seeing it and like watching the para pros who were assigned to them, see it and interact with it was just fascinating and awesome. And I had some of the parents come and talk to me about it afterwards because their parent, their kids were talking about it later. And one of those, um, one of those kids, her mother was at the library and they then started building escape rooms at our local library um, for this community as well. And so it's, it started spreading that way, right? Where I used it in the elementary school and then they wanted me to train more of the elementary schools locally. Uh, and then um, one of the teachers or one of the parents there that found out what I was doing was at another one of the local colleges, um, Saginaw Valley State University asked me to come over and lead a reacting to the past workshop there. Um, I got pulled in for a professional development workshop, which led to a presentation at two high schools in the area. Um, along the way, um, a dean for um, also Saginaw Valley schools, but he was part of Leadership Midland. Um, pulled us that way. Um, Dow Chemical, which is based here, uh, does game-based learning with some of their leadership institutes. And so I was not ready to take something on at that point because it was me and a couple of others flailing around and we were not gonna, but they pulled us in to see what they were doing, right? They wanted to start building a connection. So I had to go into seeing this. Um, they were doing um, a massive board game and I'm blanking on the name for that right now too, right? So these game design workshops started developing out. With that- um, Dr. True, before we yeah. move too quickly, I, we had a question that felt relevant. Um, so Vish asked, when writing a read ahead package, what gamified design could be implemented to encourage students to read the read ahead package? So how do you get students to start that process? Actually read before they come in for the game. Um, so it's a trick on that one, right? So. You're a you're never going to find a 100% solution. Let's start there. Um, you're going to get well, each time you do something, you're going to get more. So let's let's start there. Right. So in my course, they have the escape room. And when they do the escape room, they haven't done any reading ahead of time, but they see the game and they see the game mechanics and they're diving into it and they're building it out and they're figuring it out. Well, the next time I give them a little bit more material where they have to prep for the game, right? And if they come into that game and they're underprepared, it's not me that they're afraid of because what happens is the more prepared students enter into that space and really dominate the game for that day, right? Now, it doesn't throw it off. It's not gonna hurt their grade. So you need to make sure when you're using games in this space, winning the game doesn't give you a grade, right? Winning the game is, the intrinsic goal, but your assignments, and I can talk about all of that stuff too, um, and how you assess them, but it's, you assess them in similar ways. Your assignments lead to that. Um, your participation and your preparation give you your grade, right? So, but when other students sort of dominate the game, the next one, those students who had fallen behind um, on that first game or on the second day of that first game, depending on how long that game is, 
come in more prepared, right? And so the answer is, um, it depends on how you set it up. I try to scaffold my class so that I do that. Um, it's not a direct answer to it, but if you're using more games, you can scaffold it in further. Um, with others, I'll tell students that it's a game um, that they're preparing for, and that helps, but it's, it's not gonna be 100%. Just wait and see if there's a follow-up question before I go on. Not yet, but okay. I'll, keep I'll just continue. And if there is, I'll, I'll jump back at it. Um, so our experience grew uh, both locally and nationally, right? Which is what um, you sort of want to go. We started having presentations. Uh, I went to the University of Texas at Dallas. I went to Brigham Young University. Um, other colleagues started presenting on the games that we had developed um, because we'd modify games and we, we left them open, right? They're, they're board games, they're kind of open source. You can take them and modify them how you want. And so one of my colleagues actually modified a game that I'd created and presented it at Gen Con Trade Day. Uh, and it got picked up uh, a sort of a little out of, well, it, it got picked up in a really strange way. We hadn't expected it to be coming and this was, one of the surprises, um, it was an agile trainer at, um, Arcan at Walmart at, in Bentonville, Arkansas. And he used the game and he was running 2000 people through the game um, in his training sessions to get them to think more agilely when faced with um, problems and when faced with changing situations on the fly. And he really liked the game for what it did and he provided a support and feedback on it. But it also told us that these games could be used in other ways, right? So Leadership Midland ended up wanting to use this game. So we trained them on this. Um, we built that escape room that you saw at the beginning that we built out was uh, for the book Station 11, there we go, um, was only supposed to run for two weekends. Uh, we weren't planning a big audience, but it, it went out, it got put in local news and by the end, we had over 400 participants in the escape room and it was up a year later. It would have had more. We just, we hadn't planned student workers over the summer or others to keep running and setting up the game, right? Um, and then um, at some point, and I don't know who, if any of you are that person, please identify it. At some point, um, uh, Money Paul Education Group uh, based in Money Paul, India reached out to so the largest um, uh, educational uh, provider, higher educational provider in South Asia. And they reached out to have us start leading workshops for them, right? And so that's when we really started to expand our, our workshop base. Okay, but all of this uh, led to the need for a press, right? So we've now got a center built. Um, it's going well-ish, uh, but funding at universities is always tight and we need to find um, a way to fund it, but a press isn't necessarily the way to fund it. Um, but it's also the games are having, there's interest in the games that we're developing. And one of the things that you have to have at a university um, to get academics to continue to publish is there needs to be a way for it to benefit for tenure and promotion. Um, that's not everybody, right? I'm not, but it's, it needs to count for your promotion and that gives you more space. So we started thinking about, we have games that people are interested in, people are wanting to use them in the classrooms. Uh, we want to create a scenario where games, just like articles and books go through a double blind peer review process so that they can count towards tenure and promotion for people who aren't in the game design field, right? If you're in the game design field, there's a natural conduit for you. But if you're not in the game design field, um, it wasn't really looked upon with um, sort of any kind of rigor. And so how do we get it there? Um, and the game that started it is that game that I mentioned that Walmart picked up. It's called Plagues, Poxes, and Postules. It has not been published. Uh, and you'll understand why. Uh, it is a game about rapid demographic collapse due to disease. Um, I wrote the game prior to the pandemic. Uh, 
And the last time I ran the game was two weeks before we went into COVID shutdown. Um, it is eerie is what that game is. It is a cooperative based game that runs in about 20 minutes uh, that was designed to help students understand um, the impact of rapid demographic collapse in the Americas or in medieval Europe uh, on the communities, right? So the game, um, initially we had a press that was interested and that press was um, University of Mexico Press uh, and they were interested and we had a contract signed and we actually had a series of games on Latin America. The series itself was gonna be called History of the Americas and we had four games ready to go and more in the hopper. And um, what ends up happening is the governor of the state of New Mexico and the president of the university get into a spat and the governor of the university, the governor of the state defunds the university for a little while and they have to start making budget cuts. And our series, which was about to launch, had nothing, had no contracts signed, right? We were actually about to sign the first one for the first game. And so they just cut it because they're like, we, we can't afford to go that way right now. And so we knew there was interest, um, but we didn't have a press. One of my colleagues was at another conference and they were talking to Oxford University Press and Oxford University Press was interested. So of course we started chasing this. Um, I can't remember the title for the series at that point. I think it's History Through Games, but it was something like that. Um, and we were starting to build out what the series was gonna be like. We had gotten approval on all the levels. We were waiting for the contract and then the pandemic hit. And um, at that point, we were creating games that worked for in-person learning and they did not feel like launching a new risky uh, series that encouraged people in large groups to be together in one space in the midst of a pandemic, which I can't blame them. So what we started doing in this process, right? These are both history series. They didn't include a wider tranche of games, but my colleagues in earth and atmospheric sciences had been building up games and in chemistry had been building up games. And we were trying to find publication spaces for them as well. And one of my colleagues um, had an article, she had been doing assessment on this game and she was publishing the article on the assessment for it. And it's on the hydrologic cycle. And the, the journal article really interested in it, but they were only willing to publish the journal article if there was a place for them to get access to the game. So people could read the journal article and then go out and get the game. And so she needed a location for that. And so we looked to GameCrafter and we started the process of thinking through, okay, how would we do publication? Um, and maybe we do print on demand with GameCrafter. Uh, and so our first game, though many of you may have heard of Monumental Consequence, and that's the first one we kickstarted. Our first game was um, Hydrologic Cycle, and we're going to come back around to that one um, and overhaul it now that we have a better idea of what we're doing um, next later next year is our hope. Um, but the development of that and sort of thinking through that made us go back to Central Michigan University and ask them if we couldn't create an academic board game press there. So this is where things get weird. And I'm going to go through this a little fast because it's not terribly scintillating, but if you want me to slow down because you're going through it, I will. Um, but I think I'd rather get to the press stuff than get mired down here. Um, any of you who have worked at a university ever know that um, the ways that university work, universities work is not, is anything but clear. Um, so we got approval and that was the easy part. Uh, we went to them and I mean, it, it took effort. Let's, it took effort because Central Michigan University, while they had a press, their press did exactly one thing. It published the Michigan Historical Review and many people on campus didn't know it had a press. Uh, so we were able to lean into the fact that we had a press that published one thing to create the Central Michigan University Press. Now, we no longer publish the Michigan Historical Review, 
um, it went off to the Michigan Historical Society. Uh, and now the only thing at Central Michigan University Press is us, the Scholarship and Lore series. Um, the provosts and VPs got onto it. They were nervous because new is scary. Uh, but we also presented the evidence. We've been doing assessment on friendship networks and acquaintance networks. And they increased by 70, 73 to about 90%. Acquaintance networks, 90%-ish, high 80% to low 90s. Friendship networks to about 73% in game-based learning classes, generally speaking. Um, and so that uh, friendship networks and acquaintance networks have been shown to influence retention. So the board of trustees, very enthusiastic about that. Um, I did get to run the plagues, poxes, and pustules game for the board of trustees because it was pre-pandemic. Um, and there was something satisfying about uh, having killed off my president and members of the board of trustees. Um, now, please, note, I like my president. Um, he's a good guy, but it was fun going through that process. Uh, and we had a bunch of colleagues who were also uh, ready to go. And so we had enthusiasm and we were ready to go. But uh, I mentioned that I was going to talk about failures. So the staff, they are not the failure. Our staff is amazing. They do lots of really, really great things. But one of the things that I had to learn uh, was the lack of communication from the top echelons of the university to the people who are working within their various units, right? So I, I say failures one through 10, it's failures all over the place. Like it is so many failures here. Um, so one of the things that I would do differently and still need to do, please note, I have not done this. Um, I thought about it while writing this, uh, is create a pitch sheet to share with the staff members at Central Michigan University. The reason for this is I need to describe what we're doing, where we're going and who we have approval from and what we need them to do. Um, part of it is, is that we assumed that by having the upper administration approving what we were doing, that we could then go to the staff and go, hey, Here's the thing that VP so-and-so said that we could do. It goes to you and we were expecting a nice smooth path. Uh, they often didn't know we were coming. They didn't know what we were doing and they didn't know what to do with us. Um, and in fact, on a number of things, um, including our e-commerce site, which if you go and try to find our e-commerce site, um, it's not set up yet. It's getting set up this week. Uh, it's been in work for 15 months now. Um, it started at one person and it went all the way up to the VP of that unit and then dropped back down to the person we started with and then stalled for a while and then went all the way back up to the same VP and then dropped back down. It did two loops through that process. Um, and it wasn't their fault. They just didn't know what to do because every step of the way, everything that we were doing was new and there was no path and we had to create the path. We had to tear up their, the, what they did normally, and we had to become the exception to all of the rules. And so one of the things I learned is that patience, while many people uh, think it's a virtue, it also sucks. I don't have it, I suck at it. Um, but I was trying really hard to be patient in this process and I learned that I needed to escalate faster than I was doing. Um, if the people don't know what to do with what you're bringing to them, they aren't going to do anything with it, right? They're going to sit on it and they're not going to try to figure it out. So you have to advocate. You have to carry the pitch. You have to come back to them and come back to them and come back to them. And you have to keep going. Now, part of the problem is that we're in a point of high staff turnover as well, right? Where lots of people are getting hired away for new jobs. And so we had some really amazing people that we worked with who really like, they thought what we were doing was great and they took it on their own shoulders and carried it forward and then they got hired away or they shifted to um, a different position, right? And we, we lost them. And so we had to start over again, but nobody ever told us that we lost them because they were in a different unit. They suddenly disappeared. And we then had to figure that out that they were gone. And the next time we showed up, we're like, ah, um, and had to move forward. So where this left us, um, we had been building over time um, connections to all units on campus. This was actually one of my goals was that 
every unit on campus. I wanted them to be aware of what we were doing, to be aware of what we could do for them. And I wanted us to have some connection into that space. So we had built a lot of bridges. Um, and again, I said I grew up in Minnesota. Um, I, I'm very much Minnesota nice, um, but sometimes you have to set aside the Minnesota nice. Sometimes it's Minnesota passive aggressive. If any of you are from Minnesota and you disagree with that, um, you're a very nice person and we should talk. talk. Uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, um, in this space, what we found is that sometimes people didn't want to tell you that they didn't want to move it. They just wanted to be nice to you and they wanted to say, yes, you can do it, but they didn't actually want to help you through that process. And so you have to you have to push. Um, this is a privilege that I have, right? In part, I can push because let's be let's be honest, I'm a white straight guy uh, and I've got tenure. Um, and so I can push with a little bit more security. So uh, Kickstarter is something that is in the industry, right? This is, if any of you have done board games, uh, you, you are aware of Kickstarter and board games place within Kickstarter. Um, so as we wanted to build the press, we knew that if we wanted to be in the industry, um, Kickstarter was a place we needed to be at that point. I realize now there's movement to other places, but at that moment there wasn't. Um, and so we started getting approval in fall of 2020 uh, and we started building it. And the game we wanted to run was Monumental Consequence by Mary Beth Looney, which we've already run um, and it was successful. But to do this, we needed a Kickstarter account and it can't be a personal account. It has to be a university account, right? So we have to get permission for that. We also need to have bank account information and it obviously can't go to a bank account that we control. It has to go to the university bank account. Um, and they didn't, like everybody had said, yeah, go for it, but it wasn't going around. And in fact, the first group that we went to said, nope, that wouldn't be in our field. And the group that we then ended up landing on was that first group, right? That cycle again of who's going to start this and do this for us. Um, and so we needed a Kickstarter account and we needed access to, um, to the bank account and they didn't want to trust us with either of those. Um, and so we were building this out, we were building out our case, and everybody was telling us they were excited about what we were doing. Uh, we had, we planned to run it um, that May, and then it just kept getting delayed because we weren't getting the permissions. And then at the end of June, on June 27th, I was told that they were closing the Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and we were being it. And so at that point, um, I did fire and brimstone. Uh, and I started burning the various academic bridges, not academic bridges, but the various bridges that um, I'd been building up and calling in uncomfortable favors. But I also had really amazing support from people uh, who wanted to see us go forward. We had some very serious conversations about um, whether or not the center could fund itself and support itself. Uh, and in the end, the goal is, is that it will be an entirely self-supporting uh, center by the end of this next academic year. We'll see, we're, we're on track to make that, but it, it gives us some constraints. Um, it took them, so we we're supposed to be defunded in June. Our accounts at the university and our approval in August, we still didn't, we had people agreed that we should do something, but nobody had figured out who was going to open the Kickstarter, who was gonna give us bank account information. We had a donor offering us $25,000 uh, that the university wanted to accept, uh, but there was nobody who was willing to accept it because they still weren't sure if we were gonna be moving forward. Um, we had Monty Paul call us at that point for the workshops as well. So we had money coming in, but it was, it was all new. So people were really concerned about uh, what it was going. What we found was that other universities had Kickstarter branded elements, Duke University and Yale, uh, but they weren't university Kickstarter um, platforms, right? Um, here's the thing that really surprised me in this process is the number of units involved. So there had to be an academic unit involved. Why? Because that's my unit. Budget planning and analysis had to be involved. 
um, for obvious reasons. Research and sponsored programs was who I thought would be running, we'd be running through, but it wasn't them. Uh, information technology for obvious reasons. Advancement alumni and donor support is who it runs through. Um, they considered it advancement. So they're the ones in charge of the Kickstarter account. And then the surprising one to me was payroll and travel services, but they had the tech support that we needed. Um, if you're gonna get it done, you need strong support. You have to be willing to eat crow at times. Uh, you have to be willing to have your wings clipped. So I was silenced for a while in this process. I was told not to talk to anybody. Um, and uh, those, the people I wasn't supposed to talk to are no longer at the university, um, but it, it was sort of changes were happening. Um, you want transparency um, with everyone involved, right? So Mary Beth coming into this with Monumental Consequence, she knew everything that was going on. She didn't come into this and she knew all along what was going on. Um, you want the CMU staff to know, I wanted my provost to know what was going on. Um, and our artists know, everybody who's involved in our games know where, where we're going. Um, and you have to admit what you don't know um, and ask questions of amazing people. Okay, so continuing. Monumental consequence, building the press. Uh, in order to build a press for an academic market, what we really, really needed um, was to figure out how the game would sell. Because in a textbook market, you sell a book to, you convince a faculty member to buy a book, and then that book is picked up by all of the students in that class. And in a game, like Monumental Consequence, it can run with, I think, 38, I should know this at this point, 38 students at a go, and then it can actually be doubled um if you buy two copies of it but then once you buy one copy of it hopefully that lasts you a really long time and you never have to buy another copy of it right because we want them to be high quality games uh so we have to make sure that the games are going to be both academic but also hit the um hobby market and so with this one we looked for people who would be interested in art and who'd be interested in like how to host a murder mystery kind of feel spaces um and so you you need to start looking at those spaces now um, we did not realize that this was going to be a co-op adventure. Um, and so we thought with our reacting to the past group connection, Monumental Consequence had had 1,200 individual downloads from their library before we picked it up. Uh, so we thought that getting at least 200 backers, which was our target from them, uh, would be easy. Um, and we also had a game development conference that we had started. So we were a known entity with them. But they, as I said, were non-gamers um, and they were unfamiliar with Kickstarter. I had to walk many uh, acting to the past person through how to use Kickstarter um, and how to fulfill their surveys. Um, and I'm still doing this and I'm happy to do it. But this was that space. And we ended up getting some really amazing unlooked for allies in this process. That's the co-op adventure. And I need to call some of them out. Um, so the Zenobia Awards, many of you are probably familiar with at this point. Um, I know Goose has done some things with many participants in it. Um, I was fortunate to participate as a mentor and judge, and I learned a ton. Um, and Volko sort of pulled me in and knew what I was doing. And he introduced me to Jess Cassidy, who was amazing. Um, and Jess sort of sat down with me and had a virtual conversation and introduced me to Liz Davidson uh, Volko also introduced me to Uwe Eichart uh, at Academy Games. All of these people helped out in really big ways. Tim Hutchings uh, offered us this last supper as a stretch goal. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we had been building a relationship with Gen Con for a number of years at this point. And free of charge, they just blasted out um, our, our thing for us just to help us sort of get it going. Um, and then Board Game Geek, um, took it and pushed it out beyond that, right? Um, so all of this helped generate the, the needs that I didn't realize we were going to have as we moved forward. So I'm calling out uh, Liz Davidson at Beyond Solitaire here. She did a ton. Um, if you don't know Liz, you don't know Beyond Solitaire, go check it out. I should say, by way of um, just full disclosure, we now sponsor her podcast, um, but Liz interviewed me, and then she interviewed Mary Beth Looney, um, 
and really pushed it. And she got our first play test with a group of people that she knew together that weren't from reacting to the past together for an online play test of um, monumental consequence. And then they shared it out, right? So Liz was essential in that process. Uh, Tim Hutchings, um, who's a gamer and an academic, he's the mind behind Thousand Year Old Vampire. Um, by giving us this last supper as a stretch goal, um, he brought his supporters to us. Um, and so many of his supporters would have been interested in the game, but he um, pushed it out to them and they then started following us as well. And he started introducing us and pulling new games toward us. So um, the future for us um, has um, some surprises in that space for games that he um, introduced to us. All right. So a couple more slides here. And I guess if there are any questions, I can do that. But I'm going to get through these and we can go there. So how is this press different than other presses? And if you're interested in coming to us or interested in sort of what we do, how do we do it? So it is an evolving process. Um, I want to be clear about that and sort of I'll explain why here. So proposals uh, that come to us need to be at the prototype stage, right? So you've been running them and you've been playing them. Uh, if you come to us with an idea, we'll smile at you and say that's a nice idea. Um, but we need to see we need to see the the rule set. Um, our games need learning objectives, right? Uh, you get a board game, um, and it doesn't necessarily have learning objectives, right? So if you take Scythe or you take um, uh, you take one of the coin games, there aren't stated like, here's what you're going to learn from playing this game, right? Uh, but if you actually stop to think about a game, there are things that you're learning from, it, right? Um, students even, or players learn very basic things when they're playing a game. And then they learn more complex things as you get into more complex and more dynamic systems, right? But we need those learning objectives stated very clearly because they're one of the things that we tell other educators, these are the things that you can expect your students to get out of it. Um, but we don't want what's known as chocolate covered broccoli. Um, the education is a key component of our games, but they have to have compelling gameplay, right? They should be something that is engaging uh, in the play. So one of the things I tell as I think about things and uh, is that, um, Many movies are fun, um, but some are they're compelling, but not necessarily something you want to see over and over again. So I, I'm an Avengers fan. I go to the Avengers films. I enjoy them. I've watched them multiple times. Um, Hotel Rwanda is also a really good movie, um, and it's really compelling, but I don't want to see Hotel Rwanda multiple, multiple times. Um, I've seen it, and I know it. I've actually seen it twice, but like I, the images from Hotel Rwanda don't escape my brain. Um, and similarly, some of our games are going to be games like This War of Mine, which, if you've played it, is a really compelling game um, about being in a city under siege, but you don't forget it, right? Um, it might be something you decide to go back into. I've used it with my classes, but it's not something where I feel like I want to go back into it and play it over and over again, um, unlike Slay the Spire, which I have too many hours in. Um, and it needs to be something, your game needs to be something that can be used in the classroom, but also potentially out of the classroom because we need a wider market. Uh, our review process, we do double to triple blind. Well, it's double blind peer review with three people. So I'm um, not triple blind peer review. Um, so what that means is that um, the designer of the game, um, whenever whenever possible, there are some, some instances where it's not possible, um, but the designer of the game, doesn't know who the reviewers are and the reviewers don't know who the designer is, right? So an example where double blind wasn't possible was um, Mary Beth Looney, 1200 people had downloaded the game before we got to it, right? So people who are reviewing the game could find out very easily that it was Mary Beth. Um, we have uh, a scholarship reviewer. The scholarship reviewer is a person who goes through and looks specifically at the scholarship to make sure that it's on par and that the changes that may be made, because with a game, sometimes you have to change something, right? You might have an event that happened later, happened earlier in the game um, because of function. So in the Mexican Revolution game, I had a character who needed to start as Secretary of War because he needed to be in that position of power for a twist in the game. And if you didn't have him start as Secretary of War, students would never let him into that spot, 
right? So you had to make that twist, but it was something that could be done because it still taught the historical record. So the scholarship reviewer looks and makes sure that the scholarship is sound and that the reasons for making changes make sense and they're clearly explained. You have a mechanics reviewer. Um, so this is somebody who is um, in the space of board game design. Um, and they go through and they make sure that it's a good and sound game and that the gameplay is good and engaging. Uh, but they aren't necessarily somebody who knows the scholarship, right? Because we don't have a scholar in all of those spaces. And so we have the bridge reviewer, which is the third person. And there's somebody who is a game designer who teaches a topic, but may not be a scholar on that topic, right? So they can hurdle that, that space. They then bring us their reviews and they either recommend that we publish it, that uh, the author, the designer revises and resubmits, or that we reject it outright. We take that under advisement. It goes to our editorial board, uh, which is made up of people from Rochester Institute of Technology, the University of Texas at Dallas and Central Michigan University, and is constantly shift, will be shifting and expanding again. Um, so the rest, we then take it through development. We take it through play testing and play testing and play testing and more play testing. Um, we work heavily with our designers and artists. They're very much involved in the process. Um, we want it to be a game that the designers are experts. And so we want it to be a game that they are proud of saying that, no, this meets the scholarship. Um, the, we commission the artist's work, but it also remains theirs. Our games, because of sort of the possibility of us, like at some point ceasing to exist, um, the game belongs to the center but will revert to the designer should something happen to the center. So CMU won't hold it at that point. It goes back um, to them. Okay. Uh, we got a couple questions, Dr. Truitt. If you right. wanna... Go for it, yep. All right, so um, Kevin Doyle asks, how do faculty gain credit towards promotion or tenure in this process? So um, by going through the double blind peer review process, what we do is for tenure and promotion, we'll write letters uh, to the university in question. So we, I've written a couple of these letters at this point um, to the departments at different universities, laying out in detail our uh, peer review process for this game, for the games and the scholarship, um, and that's worked. So that's, that's how it um, can then count as a publication for their tenure and promotion. Now, sure. go ahead. I was gonna, you can finish your answer. Sorry about that. I was just gonna say, um, not all universities are going to accept that, but of the people that we've worked with so far, they've they've accepted. It's been accepted by their universities. And as a follow up to that, how do you deal with kind of resistant members of your department or um, out of a out of department higher ups who might be opposed to to what you're doing? So um, yeah, I mean you're going to have that, right? This is going to be something that you face and that you run into. Uh, we've I. I've had that part of the reason I'm smiling here is when I got to CMU, one of my colleagues in the history department was largely opposed to what I was doing. I always sort of jokingly suggested that she thought that I was tearing down, I was kicking and tearing down the ivory tower as I went. Um, and 11 years in, not I, but she recommended to the department and it was approved that um, our MA students be able to do a thesis that involves games. Um, and so one of the ways that I do it on my campus is that I have an open door policy for my classroom. I invite faculty and colleagues in so they can see the games being used and they can see the learning as it's happening. Um, with the games that we're creating, we're creating curriculum for all of them. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit. And so that's another thing where um, and they, they are fairly in-depth curricular guides are about 50 pages um, where they can see the materials as well. So they can, you know, it's got citations and it's got learning instruction. So um, all of this is stuff that gets presented. Um, it, it's opening up more. It's not 100%, but that's in part why we're doing this. Um, and we talk and we talk and we write letters and that seems to be working. All right, um, and Daniel Rio Tinto asks, 
he want, uh, I'm looking for ways to use this war of mine with my international security study, teach them about the idea of human security and the hardships civilians experience experiencing war go through. Um, he'd like to hear about your experience using that and what you think. Um, so I think, so I would use it um, in my um, honors class that was sort of a sandbox class, right? And what I wanted to do is I wanted my students to understand um, the seriousness of war and trying to survive in a city under siege. Um, now I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing any of the things you're doing. My learning objectives were different. Um, and so one of, one of the elements behind it was, I'm trying to remember, um, this was a moment, uh, well, there've been, the world has so many wars going on and there was one that was very prominent in that moment. And it's pretty sad that I'm blanking on it. I think it was um, when I was teaching the class, uh, in the Middle East, um, I'm sorry that my brain keeps short circuiting. Um, help me out here. Uh, Wait, what year was it? It's during. It's it was the year of um, all of the uprisings against the various dictators in the Middle East that started in North Africa, and then it spread. Anyway, I'll get there. Um, so there were some cities under siege, and I wanted my students to be doing research on those regions. And my students specifically said that they, they're they doing the research, but they didn't, they're having problems, Syria, there we go, Syria. They're having problems understanding what was going on in Syria um, and that they didn't feel, they were just sort of numb to the violence and that they didn't really feel it. And so one of the ways that I did use this war of mine was I wanted them to understand it. Um, and as, and they wanted to sort of understand it better as well. Um, and so we entered into it. This is the only time I have given students my direct cell phone number though. Um, because I was like, if you're playing the game and you just need to talk or you need to pause, we're going to do that. Um, and we've had points because I use serious games. We've had points where I just completely stop the game. And that needs to be something you're open to and willing to do where you just, stop it and you you have that conversation and so um it was a unique group of students um and it worked well i think with your class you'd want i recommend a you play through it all the way um be aware that anything that can happen in that game that can happen in war can happen in the game right so if you're playing a female character that female character might get raped in that game um and your students need to be aware of that going into it um, there are, um, violence that can be done that you just need to be aware of and prepared for that. You have, you have to prepare that game for the class and have very frank and open conversations. And if the students, because of their pastor, for whatever reason, don't want to enter into it, you need to have an alternate assignment for them. Right. Um, and you need to think through what that can be. Um, and so open dialogue is what you wanna have as you go into that. Um, it is an incredibly powerful learning experience though for the students. So it's not, a, it isn't the answer you wanted, but I hopefully it gets there and I can expound more if you want. Thank you so much. That, that's all we got for now, but I'll okay. definitely interrupt again soon. That's fine. So, um, and I'm almost done here too. Uh, so what do we published? Well, first off, you'll notice we have a lack of focus. Um, in part, that lack of, focus is, is intentional. Um, so what kind of games do we publish? Well, if you go to certain game publishers, right, they have a feel, right? You, you go to GMT games, you know you're getting sort of a war game. If you go to um, Stonemaier games, you sort of know the feel of Stonemaier games. Simon games, you're getting, you know, minis. You, you know what they are. Our, our theme is educational, um, but we don't do reacting to the past games. So I can say that, right? If you've got a reacting to the past game idea, a large LARP kind of game, that should get a reacting to the past. They're interested in them, they'll look at it and they'll tell you whether or not they wanna publish it. Um, we want games that work in a classroom. They're predominantly tabletop, um, but I use that word loosely, right? So I wouldn't call Werewolf a tabletop game, but um, Monumental Consequence is more akin to Werewolf than it is 
to a tabletop game. Um, what we're trying to do is fill a gap that we see in the learning circle. We believe that game-based learning can be there. And so as more presses come on board and create more games in the space, we'll narrow our focus, right? Um, so we did Monumental Consequence. Our next game coming out is a Zenobia game. It's a cooperative game, Rising Waters, um, and it's based on the uh, 1920s, Mississippi, 1927 uh, Mississippi flood. And you are play, playing black sharecroppers who are trying to survive the rampant flooding and the racism uh, inherent in that moment. And um, the game after that, um, that we're doing, we're partnered with Ion Games with um, From Darkness into Light. Uh, which is another fantastic game that was one of the Zenobia finalists. And then the one after that, I mentioned Tim Hutchings earlier. Well, Jason Cox is uh, doing a classroom version of 500 year old, of thousand year old vampire called 500 year old vampire. And it's a very different format as well. Um, we want to support other presses coming on board. And in fact, I just had a conversation with another press that's looking to get into the space. Uh, and so we'll narrow over time, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, so what are we publishing? Um, we're publishing a number of different types of games. But the other thing that we're doing is we're starting to publish curricula uh, for the game. So all of our games will have curriculum published with them, um, but we're also licensing those and those are getting published and they're getting um, reviewed as well. So the first one that we just licensed is actually with Thorny Games uh, for their game dialect. Um, and we're creating partnerships. Right. Um, and so if any of you out there are interested in um, partnering with us in some way, shape or form, let us know, because we all do better when we all do better. Um, we're doing synchronous online courses with Gen Con. The first one launches next week with Eloy LaSanta. Um, we have an exciting group of people coming up next year, and we're going to announce that soon. I was hoping to have the contracts signed uh, by this week, but they're not all signed yet, so I can't announce yet, but um, they're coming. Uh, we're working with Ion Games, as I mentioned. Um, we're working with Thorny Games. And really, we're talking with anybody who's interested in working with us in this space. Um, not everything's going to stick, but it's um, sort of finding our path through this process, right? Um, who we are, here's uh, the people. You've got me. You've got my co-director, Tracy Davis. I'm also, I'm going away. I'm lucky. Um, I'm fortunate. I'm going to be on sabbatical starting June 1st. So Tracy is going to be um, driving the, the ship for a little while. Then we have our associate director, Andrew Deveni, who also own, is one of the co-owners of Superhero Necromancer Press. We have people, as I said, all over um, teacher education, animation, geology, finance and law, Spanish. It goes on. Um, so there you go. I will stop my blathering there um, and take questions if you have more of them. Thank Great. You. We we we, de we had definitely have more questions. Um, so we our first question comes from uh, Michael McRae Dennis. So he's developing. I'm developing an AR experience to bring scholarship awareness to students. Do you think this could be feasible as an interactive game? Yes. <laughs> um, I I think it could ab absolutely go there. Um, I what you I mean as you go into it as you start doing it. Let the students know what you're doing. Let them know that they're part of an experiment. Um, I, and students will dive into it. You're gonna learn as much from them, if not more, as they will from you. Um, what I encourage you to do is, right, you bring them in on it and let them help you through that process. I know it, it feels weird to say that. Um, what I often like to do, and it was all of my students are, taking a very, very needed break right now is, I like to have my students talk about this. Um, I, I take them to conferences specifically because people don't wanna hear from me, they wanna hear from my students. Um, and the students are the best advocates for what you're doing, um, but they're also your best feedback and they're your players, right? So whenever you're using a board game, you wanna get it into the hands of people who are gonna be playing it a lot. So um, yeah, that's where you wanna go. 
Um, this is a really interesting question. Uh, has the lay perception of modern games as large digital been a barrier in your attempt to use kind of physical board games mark, um, for learning? Or, or perhaps the use of physical board games is seen as more accessible, especially from those without experience playing games in academia? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really funny. So I, uh, I appreciate this question. Um, every time we go out there and we talk to people about using what we're doing, they're like, so you're doing video games, right? And we're like, well, not really. And I should state, right? So this part of mine I used as a video game. Um, and I used Civilization six, five, I, one of the civs I used in a class at one point as well. Um, I, I play a lot of video games. I like video games. Um, I don't have any computer programming skills. I've been a part of a couple of video game development projects, um, but I don't have those skills. And um, Central Michigan University, we lost our video game developer a couple of years ago, um, and we haven't gotten a replacement yet. We're sort of plugging that hole in a different way, but need sort of because of that, we only go the board game route. They were open to video games, but it, they're more expensive. So my conversations with people have been that our games, what we wanna do is we wanna create games that can be used in school districts that don't have a lot of money. Anybody who's paid attention to education in the US recently knows that our K-12 systems um, are underfunded. And um, a lot of our school teachers end up spending money for the games that they're gonna use. And so, I want something where if a student, if a teacher is putting, going to use it or a school district is gonna adopt it for 25 bucks or 50 bucks or $75, whatever the cost is, that it's gonna be there for a while and they can replace it. And so as, as I start talking about the fact that our games can be, are affordable to a school district, right? And let's say you buy a copy of, um, well, let's say you buy a coin game, right? And you use a coin game in a classroom. And I, I have some colleagues who do that. It's you pay the fee, but then you have it, right? At some point, you may end up replacing pieces to it, or it may get worn out, right? Monumental consequence, cards may tear and whatever, but replacing that's affordable, right? So we want our games to go there. And as soon as we start talking to that for people, um, they really like, they get it and it doesn't become a problem. I also point out that we're in the modern day of sort of the golden age of board games at the moment. Uh, there's some research leads me to think that the end of the 19th century was another one, but that's another topic for another day. Um, and when I point out that I think board games are estimated to bring in about $25 billion in 2025. Um, it's small compared to video games. Um, but the market for board games is estimated to be about $25 billion in 2025. I'd have to find the exact number. I've got it around here somewhere for some research I've been doing. Thank you. Um, okay. When designing simulations that incorporate XR and tabletop components, what would you recommend for designers? Um, for, well, I guess it's going to depend on if you're looking at an educational space or not. So. If you're looking, whenever you're looking at an educational space, and that's what I'm going to talk to because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, and I'm not going to be able to point you in the direct, like go talk to GMT or go talk to Stemeyer or Simon or Fort Circle about their spaces for other things. Um, when you're looking at a classroom space um, and you're developing sort of pieces, uh, you want, the games need to be fairly easily taught. And so the pieces pieces can be intimidating, right? So one of the things you have to think about when you're designing and when you're thinking about the pieces and you're thinking about um, an AR, um, think about scaffolding, right? If you're teaching a game design class, that's one thing, but I teach a 100 level course and I use game-based learning in it. So these are students who are coming in from high school. Many of them aren't gamers. Um, and so I think about them as I go into it. Now, many of them are, right? I mean, how many, how many kids go through high school now and don't game, right? But many of them may not be board gamers. And so if I were to throw a game like Root at them, um, they would panic and run away, right? That, like, and when you talk to people who are heavy gamers, we often are like, okay, all the mechanics, all the fiddly bits, all the stuff, because it's awesome. You don't want that in a classroom game. 
Um, at least you don't want that as your entry to it, or you want students to be aware of it. So, right, I do that at my upper level courses, but not at the introductory level courses, right? Sebastian likely does it differently because Goose has a wargaming component, right? Um, but we're doing this in gen ed. So again, not a direct answer to what you're doing, um, but think about, and I, so Rising Waters actually has a lot of pieces. It has a lot more pieces um, than I was initially thinking, but they work um, and it's the route that we've decided to go. So, right, don't use a lot of pieces and then I'm using a lot of pieces. It's it's going to be based on the experience that you want to give and that you want to try. Does that answer it? I'm sorry. Hey, I, I think I think so. I think so. Um, does CLGS have plans for a PhD program? Oh, alas, no. We had a PhD program in our history uh, for a history program, and they just put that on hiatus. It doesn't mean that it's gone away, um, but that's where my PhD students went. Um, we have. Right now, what we have is a PhD in history, or really, a P, or not a PhD in history. We have an MA in history that's still active, um, but really, there are MAs and other programs that also partner in with us. Um, and we have um, the online courses that we're running with GenCon, which are lead to certificates in applied game design. Um, we're hoping with right. So we've got a minor. Right now in game design thinking, we're going to grow that into a major, we hope. And as it grows, if there's interest, we'll we'll expand it into a PhD program at some point. But we there has to be interest. The other thing is, is quite honestly, I love Central Michigan University. Um, but if you're wanting a PhD um, in games, um, Michigan State down the road has a really outstanding one. University of Michigan in Ann Arbor has one. Um, there's there's a lot of other places that are going to get you more bang for your buck um, to go to. But thanks for the interest. Um, hopefully we'll grow and we'll, we'll continue to go in the, the space. Actually, if you're looking to do non-computer game design, there you go. I'm going to, I'm going to call somebody out and he's going to either love me or hate me. Um, reach out to David Simpkins at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, David's awesome. He's a LARP game designer. Um, he's in the Magic Studios there. He does computer games as well. His main thing is analog games, um, but he's in a program that does a lot of computer games, but he works with people developing analog games too. Yeah. Um, Fish asks, how would you encourage neurodiverse students to develop games with low, low cost components? Um, so we have, um, and that was that is a fantastic question, by the way. Um, one of the one of the courses we want to do on with the Gen Con classes, and unfortunately, we're having to wait a little bit, but um, is a class for designing games for neurodiverse students uh, or neuro, neurodiverse players, right? I I think in terms of students because that's where I'm running my games, but really we're thinking when I say students, just equate players for me, if you would. Um, for neurodiverse players. So um, I would use 3D printers, honestly. Um, I would, um, when we build our games also, we have these board game kits that we've created and they are a smattering of just bits and pieces um, that we've picked up. And by bits and pieces, I mean, literally it's like, it's, well, so all of my legacy games that I've played, I cannibalize them when they're done and all of their bits go into the box. Um, but I'll also, um, I have paper clips in there. I have stray dice. I have broken bits for my kids' toys that become pieces on the board. And so, um, depending on each student that you're working with, uh, neurodiversity is, it's a really cool space to be in. Um, and sort of, again, point of full disclosure here and transparency, I have a neurodiverse kiddo. Um, he's 11. He, um, he is not on the spectrum. Um, we don't, his neurodiversity so far, there's no word for it. He has apraxia of speech. He has a lot of things that tie into ADHD and some things that tie into 
um, Asperger's, but he has neither of those, right? So when I'm talking about neurodiversity, um, his friends, he's got ADHD friends, and he's got friends that are autistic, and he's got friends that are um, uh, sort of non-neurodiverse. And um, the watching them engage and watching them work, this is sort of my lens through which I work with this. Um, they develop really insightful games, just give them the space and the opportunity um, to develop them. Now, if you're wanting to develop a game specifically for them, now I'm not a specialist on this, I just, I developed for my own kids and, and his friends at this point, right? Uh, and I hope that I'm fortunate when I'm developing my games that it's hitting my students who are neurodiverse as well. Um, but I have no training in that space and I just wanna be absolutely clear. Um, there are people with much more training in that space. Um, but they're going to engage and interact. So I, if you are developing the game, put yourself into the position where you get to play with them and you get to try it out and you get to learn from them in the same way that you would other players and adapt it and change it. Um, one of uh, my friend's kids is brilliant. And if you put a game in front of him, like he just, he gets it and he'll like, he wants root times five, right? He, 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 wants, he wants oath times five, right? Let's get even heavier, right? Um, and yet my kiddo is really happy with um, Splendor and with um, Abandon All Artichokes, right? So how would I design for them? I design by playing with them and welcoming them into it. Um, some of them are really gonna like tactile things, but each one's gonna be different. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, which books have most influenced your game design process? Um, goodness. Um, so some of my books are going to be really weird and esoteric, and others are going to be run of the mill. So Salen and Zimmerman, um, I started out reading their stuff in game design because there wasn't really a board game one there. Um, reacting to the Past, Nick Proctor did a Reacting to the Past game development game, like game design handbook. For developing those um that's very much in there um i uh i use jesse shell's um book of lenses when i'm teaching my game design class um i'm really excited and uh i have um uh um shalev and engelstein's um encyclopedia of mechanisms is something that I'm sort of constantly going back to. Um, more sort of in a, in a different lens, because I'm a historian of the colonial period in my current research, uh, I'm looking at the evolution of chess over time uh, and how that evolves. And so I'm looking at a lot of books in that space. I'm looking at a lot of card games uh, and how they shift around. There's um, uh, Cardona, Cardano's, um, book on uh what is it the rules uh so it's the gambling scholar it's the title of the book um but it's cardano is the author and it's a 16th century treatise on um probability games uh there's two 16th century catholic confessionals um on games for gamers specifically um and so i'm reading those right now and i've learned that uh, they're really concerned with people doing necromancy to influence the outcome of a game, uh, right? So, um, how does that influence my game? My my games uh, as I'm designing games, I'm I'm thinking about those, and I'm think. I mean, in part, I'm I'm looking for the story I'm just to tell with the game and through the game mechanics. So, thanks so much. Um, this is my question, but that means that everyone, if you don't have your questions in yet please put them into the chat. Um, how do you decide when you're making a game, whether you want to have a board game or a card game and how integral is it to have a board when you're designing these games? Um, so A, it's not integral to have a board at all. Um, it depends on what I'm trying to teach. So, um, so as I enter into this space, right, my, my learning objectives inform the game that I want to create. And it's also so when I teach students, 
um, about designing a game for a class, one of the things that I have in that space is what's known as replacement cost, which isn't something you'd have in a regular board game design, right? So um, if you talk to Volko, he's not going to be like, yeah, so he'll, he'll think about how long the game takes, but it's not replacing it, right? If you're sitting down to play a coin game and you're sitting down to play a coin game, right? But um, so plagues, poxes, and pustules um, was going to take up a conversation that I would have, or a lecture that I had on the Black Death. Uh, and so one of the things that I needed to do was whenever you're using a game in a classroom, it will take longer than a lecture. Right, you just you have to plan for that because you have to teach the game, you have to run the game, and then you have to debrief the game and make sure that everybody playing the game got out of it what you wanted them to get out of it. Right, so it takes longer. You spend more time on it, but the students retain the information further. And so, based on the amount of time that I want to spend on the game, right, is the amount of that sort of determines it. Right, so plagues, poxes, and pustules is a deck of cards. And I hand out the characters really quickly. And then we go and it's done in 20 minutes. And so there, the board is sort of the classroom, right? Because I'll put up signs where it's like, over here is the graveyard and over here is a town hall and over here is the jail, right? So the board becomes the space you're in, um, but it takes 20 minutes. The Mexican Revolution game, um, also a live action role-playing game, but it takes place of over eight class sessions, right? So it can run for over a month in my classroom. Um, is much, 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 much bigger. Um, for Scout, she wanted, in doing Rising Waters, well, A, there was the Zenobia Awards, but she was thinking about some other games. But in her case, it was the topic, right? So we're dealing with um, systemic racism and we're dealing with environmental flooding. And I can't talk directly to Scout, but sort of thinking through that process, like you don't, a game engine and a game mechanic that brings racism to the fore as you're fighting it as a community is a way for you to understand it as players with it not being like in a role-playing game, dealing with racism, like not that games can't do it, not that there aren't mechanics out there that can do it, but it, it's a harder shift, right? When you're dealing with that serious topic. And so a board game was a really, I, I like it. It's a really elegant way and we're, we're doing, we have three cultural consultants working on the game with us too, I wanna to be clear, um, because we wanna make sure that we get it right for members in the community. Um, and so, because we want everybody to feel comfortable playing it, but it's a topic where I think the game mechanics really help it. So a board game helped in that space. Um, the next game that I'm looking at building that's on pause at the moment, but um, is potentially gonna, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be um, a legacy game uh, or it's going to be a series of escape room puzzles. Um, and the reason for that is I want, um, I'm playing right now, I'm playing through um, uh, Emerald Flame. It's a puzzle game uh, by Post Curious and we've got like a series of packets. And so I'm envisioning my students showing up for each week of a class and giving them a packet and they have to puzzle through that packet each week to cover the materials right so i prep them outside of it sort of flipped classroom they show up here's your packet this is what you have to puzzle through that week um, and so i think about it in terms of content there's another game i developed with um david simpkins uh adam serling and Haley zarkarski um that was sort of a live action worker placement game, <laughs> if that makes sense, um, where we would group students together. Um, and it's a world history game. And the students, their group was sort of representing the player, but then each student in that group represented a piece. And so the way they would do research, the way they would do their moves, right? So in a worker placement game, you send your, per well, you stone my viticulture, you wanna grow wine, right? You, you go and you plant your vine and then you harvest your vine, right? And so you put your meeple there when you wanna do that stuff. And so the student uh, wanted to develop skills in culinary, um, right? So doing research on culinary in Asia. So then that student gets placed in that topic and they do research and they bring it back to their group the next game. And that's how they advance throughout the course. Does that answer your question? So it's sort of 
it's the learning objectives that you have in mind that help shape it, but also the replacement cost. How long do you want it to take within the context of the class? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't see any more questions, but I do. People do want to know if how they could maybe get in touch with you if they have uh, ideas or they want to talk about it. I know absolutely. you have a slide up. I can also. Uh, I'll throw up the slide, um, and um, you can reach out to me. I will. Even while I'm on um, sabbatical, I'll be responding. You'll just get the um, the notice that says, um, hey, I'm on sabbatical. I respond to things slower. If you want to get in touch with the center directly, um, let me see here if I can. Sorry, while I'm sharing, my whole thing goes away here. Let's yeah, see. I can see if I can pull it up. Cool. Um, no, I'm just trying to get to the chat to add it. So I am. If you're looking for me on Twitter, I'm at Truitt JG. So T R U I T T J G um, is my Twitter handle. Um, but you can also reach out to my colleague Tracy Davis, um, who's going to be the director, and she'll respond to you. And if you want to get involved with th some of the things we're doing, um, let us know. If you're interested in being a reviewer for us at some point, let us know. Um, all of our peer reviewed games are paid. Um, though you do, you do need to either be sort of a designer, um, or sort of some a professional in the field, not just a designer developers, otherwise, um, or, um, you need to be, uh, sort of an academic scholar in that space for the peer review process, but let us know. We're looking for more people in that space too. Um, if you're looking to partner with us in some way, please let us know. We're, we're happy to chat and I can hang out if people want to ask other questions. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much. And we really appreciate all of you joining us today. And I really appreciate all the interesting and important and good questions. Um, and any final thoughts, Dr. Truett? Um, no, thank you um, for coming and listening. Um, there's a lot to go and we need to just, I mean, we're trying to make it as inclusive as possible in all the senses of that word, um, both academia, but as well um, bringing in underrepresented community members. Um, and so as you're doing it, think about it in terms of your mechanics, think about it in terms of your play and right, the best way to get there for any of them is to bring them into the play tests and um, bring them into the process.